10 Mysteries of Ancient Malta. At just 313 square kilometers, Malta is one of the world's smallest and most densely populated countries. This Mediterranean island is also home to the world's oldest freestanding structures and enduring mysteries. Inhabited for over 7,000 years, Malta has been settled by Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, the Muslim Emirate of Sicily, and Crusaders under the Holy Roman Empire. The history of mysterious Malta is the history of the entire Mediterranean, and beyond. 1. Sipi of Melgart. The Sipi of Melgart are a pair of ornamental pillars with engravings found by the Knights of St. John on the island of Malta in the village of Marsixluk. They are considered to be from the 2nd century BCE. It is in this village that the Phoenicians reputedly landed in the 9th BC, and set up trading posts. In the Temple of Tasilg, the Sipi were unearthed, one Sippus being gifted to Louis XVI by the Grand Master of the Knights of St. John in 1782. This Sippus now sits in the Louvre and the other in the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta. The engravings are in both Phoenician and Greek testifying to the god Melkart, and Heracles as being one and the same. The question of what are the Sipi of Melkart, what do they represent, who made them and why are they important will be attempted. The cultural value of the objects and the context of their significance will be explored. Who was Melgart and why was he being worshipped in Malta? The Sippi have bilingual inscriptions, which allowed the French archaeologist, Father Jean-Jacques Barthlemy to decipher the Phoenician alphabet in 1758. The Phoenician alphabet, reputedly the source of modern Western language, has its own mythology. The Tyrian prince Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, brother to Europa and conveyor of written language is also popularized as the source. The other version, which does not really contradict the mythical one, is that of Tyrian merchant sailors using simple written characters to overcome language barriers when traveling. As the principal force in the Mediterranean the sophisticated Phoenicians' reach was tremendous, this was until pressures from the Assyrians and Babylonians weakened the city-states that make up what we consider to be collectively known as the Phoenicians, and a power shift to her greatest colony, Carthage, takes place, continuing the Punic legacy. The Sipi inscriptions read as dedications to Melkart, Heracles from two Tyrian brothers. Melkart was the Baal or Lord of Tyre, and with him comes the mythological foundations of that monumentally important city-state that spawned a colonization of the Mediterranean and some of the most revered mythical and historical characters from Heracles and Europa to Dido. The myth pertains to the joining of the two islands of Tyre to form what was one island before Alexander the Great built a land bridge to conquer it. The myth says Heracles, or Melkart, instructed the people of Tyre to build a ship to stop the islands wandering off, what were two islands were fastened together at the behest of Melkart. According to the legend two wandering rocks floated over the sea, on one of them was a burning olive tree with an eagle perched on top of it, together with a bowl. A snake was entwined around the tree, both eagle and snake lived in harmony. The text is rich with olive tree references, in fact I would argue that the symbol may relate to the worship of Iron Age gods and goddesses combining to form new ones. The olive tree being associated to Asher's many forms and the snake being sacred to Bronze Age goddesses such as Nidaba and Nebu. There's a strong case for the imagery symbolizing the phoenix, as with resurrectionary gods, Melkart was celebrated at spring. The worship of Melkart appears to originate in Tyre. According to information Herodotus got from priests in Tyre, the temple to Melgart there was established at the founding of the city 2300 years before the time Herodotus visited. There's conflict in this theory, as the worship of Melgart was supposedly introduced by the King Hiram of Tyre, who is associated with the 10th century BC and reputedly aided in the construction of Solomon's temple, as seems to be a pattern with myths, they can often be, like history, a powerful tool to convey ideas, whether that be propaganda or confusion. Melgart as a resurrectionary god has great similarities to older and newer gods of rebirth and spring. Rawlinson attributes Melgart to being the Lord or Baal of Tyre, other city-states would also have their protecting gods but would share more regional and cultural ones like El and Astarte. Perhaps, due to the prolific expansion of the Mediterranean from Tyre is the key factor that has secured Melgart's legacy of worship.
While Malta's origins are mysterious it seems apparent that the Phoenicians did colonize and integrate with the local culture. Worship of a female deity in most cultures seems to mean the same thing, the worship of fertility and the moon. In this way the name of the principal female deity need only be transposed linguistically, it really being just a case of same goddess different name as so comprehensively exemplified by the Sippy of Melgard with regards to that male deity. So there is also the Sleeping Lady, an object believed to be depicting the Lady as Tardy however made before the colonization of the Phoenicians. It being found in one of the astounding cave temples, the piece is believed to have been made in Ka. 3600 to 2500 BC. This huge leap in time shows the perplexing nature of tracing this cultural epitaph, and here there are only theories. In this the clues or hints at what might be Malta's ancient history, Herodotus points a period in Levantine history where the king of Anatolia splits his kingdom as a result of a great famine. He sends one half west to find new land. The theory is that these early settlers colonized islands in the Med. The greatest correlation, in culture is between the ancient sites of Kadalhoyuk and Gobgli Teep in southern Turkey and the temple complexes on the islands around Malta. However these somewhat similar cultures seem to be at a significant distance from each other, with the whole of Greece and its islands standing closer to the proposed point of Exodus. There does seem to be a sequence of ancient sites dedicated to the goddess leading from southern Turkey through Knossos and to Malta, however as a pattern it leaves many facts to be desired. The more recent excavations on these sites promise to reveal more about this mysterious time and shed more light on cultural migrations that leave modern historians with giant holes in their heads. For the Sippy of Melgar to be in Malta is most apartment. Malta commanding a central place in the Mediterranean and being so strategically positioned in the midst of Phoenician colonies. The Sippy were reputedly for burning incense with the inscriptions I only imagine informing bilingually a dedication and statement of cultural exchange between the Greeks and the Phoenicians with regards to their shared hero and god, Melkart or Heracles. The adoption of Melkart by the Greeks provides a fascination study as to how significantly the Phoenicians managed to export their gods and culture. It is recognized that cultural migrations were for centuries very much of east to west in the Mediterranean and that in this the Phoenicians played a signal role. The fact that Melkart is widely seen as a conflation of the more ancient Tammuz is indicative of cultural integration over centuries and the harnessing of essential ideas of rebirth and spring manifested into figures of worship. The Hellenized Melkart however stands as a mortal god and also as a land-taming hero, serving penance for a terrible crime, a much more sophisticated and modern tale that exhibits deeply human characteristics and actions being performed by a demigod. All tales tell of his epic journey in the pursuit of penance. Driven mad by the jealous goddess Hera, Heracles kills his family. His road to redemption is in the form of twelve tasks all of which involve the subduing and slaying of beasts. He also manipulates the landscape by diverting a river to clean the Aegean stables, all deeds telling of a taming of the wilderness, and propagation of the legend of a world-changing demigod and one of the most mortal or human-like gods of the ancient world. In this way perhaps the development of the story of Melgard was necessary for his legacy to survive, and this was achieved by the Greeks with Heracles and then inherited by the Romans in turn. Perhaps then the Sippy of Melgard can be seen as a true marriage of an older Phoenician culture and a more recent adaptation of it in the form of the Greeks. The inscription is a testament to a cultural collaboration and infers some moment of harmony when this is transliterated onto temple objects. The Sippy can also be seen to represent the continuity of a myth and by studying the Melgart of the Phoenicians and the Heracles of the Greeks we can see the cultural imprints of those two great civilizations. 2. 110 Hertz Healing. The High Pajama of Hal Safflini in Malta is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is believed to be the oldest prehistoric underground temple in the world. The subterranean structure is shrouded in mystery from the discovery of elongated skulls to stories of paranormal phenomena. But the characteristic that has been attracting experts, from around the globe is the unique acoustic properties found within the underground chambers of the Hypogeum. Hal Safflini Hypogeum is a cultural property of exceptional prehistoric value, 
dating back approximately 5,000 years and the only known example of a subterranean structure of the Bronze Age. The labyrinth, as it is often called, consists of a series of elliptical chambers and alveoli of varying importance across three levels, to which access is gained by different corridors. The principal rooms distinguish themselves by their domed vaulting, and by the elaborate structure of false bays inspired by the doorways, and windows of contemporary terrestrial constructions. Although not known for certain, it is believed that the hypogeum was originally used as a sanctuary, possibly for an oracle. It is for this reason that a unique chamber carved out of solid limestone, and demonstrating incredible acoustic properties has been called the Oracle Chamber. According to William Arthur Griffiths, who wrote Malta and its recently discovered prehistoric temples, a word spoken in the Oracle Room is magnified a hundredfold and is audible throughout the entire structure. The effect upon the credulous can be imagined when the Oracle spoke, and the words came thundering forth through the dark and mysterious place with terrifying impressiveness. It is said that standing in the hypogeum is like being inside a giant bell. At certain pitches, one feels the sound vibrating in bone and tissue as much as hearing it in the ear. Sarasota art and architecture critic Richard Storm explained the sensation, because you sense something coming from somewhere else you can't identify, you are transfixed. The acoustic properties within the hypogeum have already been studied extensively. It was found by Maltese composer Ruben Zara, and a research team from Italy that sound resonates at 110 Hz within the oracle chamber, and this matches the same or similar frequency that has been found in many other ancient chambers around the world, including Newgrange in Ireland. According to Dr. Robert Jan from Princeton University, it may be the dimensions of the room or the quality of the stone that determines the exact pitch of this echo behavior. But the question remains, was it intentional? Was the hypogeum actually designed to enhance amplification? If so, why? Is it possible that the designers of these spaces knew something that modern scientists are just rediscovering? One theory put forward by Paolo Di Bertolis and Niccolò Bisconti of the Universities of Trests and Sina respectively is that the chamber was constructed in such a way as to create it acoustics that would affect the psyche of people, perhaps to enhance mystical experiences during rituals, and this perspective has received scientific backing. Dr. Ian Cook of UCLA and colleagues published findings in 2008 of an experiment in which regional brain activity in a number of healthy volunteers was monitored by EEG through exposure to different resonance frequencies. Their findings indicated that at 110 Hz the patterns of activity over the prefrontal cortex abruptly shifted, resulting in a relative deactivation of the language center and a temporary shifting from left to right-sided dominance related to emotional processing. This shifting did not occur at other frequencies. Whether it was deliberate or not, the people who spent time in the hypogeum under conditions that may have included ritual chanting, were exposing themselves to vibrations that may have impacted their thinking. In addition to stimulating their more creative sides, it appears that an atmosphere of resonant sound in the frequency of 110 would have been switching on an area of the brain that biobehavioral scientists believe relates to mood, empathy and social behavior. Despite the plethora of research on the acoustic properties of the Oracle Room, there remain just as many questions as answers. It is for this reason that the Hypogeum was the key location for the Archaeoacoustics Conference held between 19th and 22 ND February. During the event, a multidisciplinary undertook a challenging and unprecedented experiment. Ultra-sensitive microphones were placed in the oracle chamber of the Hypogeum and digital recorders were used to test the response of the chamber by different voices and by simple musical instruments which could have been present in the time the Hypogeum was in use. 4000 to 2500 BC. The results revealed that a male human voice can stimulate the resonance of the structure at two frequencies, 114 Hz and 68 to 70 Hz. The use of a horn and conch shell did not create any resonance at all, while a friction drum produced low resonance. Interestingly, a shamanic natural skin hoop drum created a strong stimulation of resonance by harmonics of the drum at 114 Hz. The response was the same as that produced by a male voice singing ooh. A female voice did not produce the same effect. While we may never know for certain what transpired within the Hal Safalini Hypogeum 5000 years ago, 
scientists are moving ever closer to unraveling some of the mysteries of this ancient and incredible site. 3. Phoenician Shipwreck A group of divers have discovered a Phoenician shipwreck dating back to 700 BC off the coast of Gozo Island in Malta, according to a news report in the Times of Malta. It is a unique and immensely important finding as it is the oldest known shipwreck in the central Mediterranean, it is among the oldest and most complete Phoenician ships ever recovered, and it will serve to shed light on inter-regional trade and exchange in antiquity. The announcement was made by Malta's Minister for Justice, Culture and Local Government, Owen Bonasai, who said the wreck was found in Maltese waters at a depth of 120 meters. This discovery is considered to be unique not only here, but internationally as well because it is the oldest, or considered to be the oldest shipwreck in the central Mediterranean and it is in a fantastic state of preservation, project co-director Dr. Timmy Gambin told the Times of Malta. To date, researchers from France, the United States, and Malta have recovered 20 lava grinding stones, weighing some 35 kilograms each, and 50 amphorae of seven different types which suggests the ship had visited different harbors. Based on the cargo, scientists believe the ship was sailing from Sicily to Malta to sell its cargo when it sank. The whole operation, which is being supervised by the Superintendents of National Heritage and explored by GR Plan Project, is currently focused on piecing together over 8,000 photographs to create a very high resolution and detailed 3D model of the site. Following this, the results will be published and the international team will be working out how the site can be enjoyed by the general public. It has already been added to the National Inventory of Cultural Property and steps are being taken to protect the site for its future preservation. One of the project's researchers explained that the shipwreck is a typical Phoenician vessel which would have measured some 50 feet long. The Phoenician civilization, which lasted from 1550 BC to 300 BC, was based in present-day Tyre in Lebanon. They traveled across most of the Mediterranean, not as conquerors but as traders. The strategic location of the Malta in the Mediterranean made the islands a safe refuge for the Phoenicians during their long sea voyages. By the 7th century BC the Phoenician presence was part of the identity of the Maltese islands. They are also widely believed to have set the origins of the Maltese language. The Phoenician civilization was eventually conquered by the Persians and then by the Greeks. 4. Mysterious Cartruts The islands of Malta and Gozo in the Maltese archipelago are scarred with hundreds, if not thousands, of parallel lines seemingly cut deep into the stone. These ancient grooves have puzzled experts for centuries. Some of the strange tracks deliberately plunge off cliffs or continue off land and into the ocean. Who made these enigmatic tracks, and why? The tracks are gouged into the rock, crisscrossing the islands, most notably at Masrigar Ilkber, a prehistoric cliff site on Malta. Like the impressive Nazca lines of Peru, or giant stone circles in the Middle East, the mysterious nature of the tracks has confounded researchers for years. However, unlike the desert markings done for ceremonial, or a divinely directed purpose, the so-called car truts of Malta are thought to be indications of transportation or industry railways of the ancient world. Dubbed car truts due to their resemblance to tracks left by carts, it's not known for certain how or why they were made. These clearly man-made ruts are dual channels, parallel grooves etched into the limestone bedrock of the islands. The channels measure about 8 to 15 centimeters deep, but can be as deep as 60 centimeters. Width between the tracks extends about 140 centimeters, but not in all instances. The tracks measured at the San Juan site in Malta are said to be half a meter in depth, making them the deepest to be found. If correct, it seems impossible that any vehicle, sled or wheeled, could be dragged along them as the platform, axle would have to be over one or two meters high, notes an article by cartrutsmalta.com Some of the ruts are narrow and deep, squared off as if cut with tools, while others are wide, V-shaped, and shallow, as if worn away by time and use. Does this indicate different vehicles for different uses, or does it simply mean the tracks have been weather-worn differently? The purpose of the ruts seem to defy explanation, as some tracks surprisingly travel directly off cliff edges, or up and down very steep ridges, and some even drive off the island and into the sea, continuing underwater.
The ruts are so prevalent at Masrigari Ilkbur that the location has been nicknamed Clapham Junction by an Englishman named David Trump. The ruts there are so numerous and seem to cause such a traffic jam, that they resemble the complex network of tracks found at the busy railway station switching yard in London, England. Similar types of tracks can be found in Italy, Greece, Turkey, Spain, France and Germany, but they're not of the same origins and were created for different and known purposes. Some of those tracks were built purposefully with masonry, and some of the patterns were caused by natural erosion on wagon tracks. These differences make the Malta tracks unique in the world. Archaeologists presume the ruts in Malta were made by repeated use of carts, skids or sleds, wheeled or on runners, going over the same route over decades or centuries. It's thought that goods may have been transported using this system. Still others wonder if the deliberate channels were a prehistoric irrigation system stretching across the islands. A less accepted theory suggests the lines served an astronomical purpose. Further complicating the matter is how the carts were moved. If animals were used to draw the carts, their footprints might be evident between or outside the parallel grooves, but there's no evidence of that. Some researchers thus imagine the carts were pulled or pushed by humans. It is speculated the lines were left by new settlers who came to Malta from Sicily at the beginning of the Bronze Age. About 2000 BC however, Maltese archaeologist Anthony Bonanno theorizes that the ruts are Phoenician constructions, which would date them to the more recent 7th century BC. The mysterious lines are connected by some researchers to the amazing temples of Malta. It is thought that the tracks might be the remaining evidence of how the temples were built. Could it be that the slides were used to transport heavy quarried rock from far off to the temple sites? The temple sites of Malta and Gozo are famous round the world. The more than 30 stone temple complexes and structures date from 5500 to 2500 BC. They are said to be the oldest known freestanding monuments in the world, older than Stonehenge and the pyramids of Egypt. One proposed scenario includes the idea that the card ruts were created during this temple period as topsoil was transported to and from sites in order to create nearby fields for growing crops. Archaeologist Anthony Bonanno believes that the ruts are undoubtedly associated with the temples. He cites the Buscataria group of tracks, which runs next to the largest and most important quarry in Malta. Bonanno surmises they were intended to transport huge construction blocks from the quarry to a road in ancient times. Not unlike during the construction of Stonehenge where some of the heavy stones were transported as far as 225 kilometers, 140 miles, could it have been that certain types of stones were preferred by the Malta temple builders, and thus any means necessary were used to get them to a build site? The ruts do not seem to have obvious starting or ending points at megalithic temples in Malta, and so this remains only a theory for now. It has not been proven that all of the ruts were even caused by heavy loads. A number of tracks seem to be so perfect they might have been cut by hand. Author and journalist Graham Haycock writes, It is certain, too, that they were not simply worn away in the tough limestone by the passage of car wheels over periods of centuries, as many have wrongly theorized. On the contrary, there is no proof whatsoever that car wheels ever ran in these ruts, which were initially carved out of the bedrock with the use of tools, in his book Underworld, The Mysterious Origins of Civilization. So many questions remain surrounding the enigmatic car ruts of Malta. The channels obviously played an important purpose in the lives of the ancient people who lived there but their significance, and the role they played may never be known. The answers have become a secret lost in time. 5. Temple People of Malta The ancient temple people civilization of Malta did not suffer invasions, widespread disease or famine, past research has shown. Why their culture died is a mystery. A large team of researchers is carrying out studies to determine why the temple people's civilization on the Mediterranean islands of Malta and Gozo ended. The temple people had an incredibly rich culture with unique art, stone temples and structures, huge burial sites and advanced agriculture going back to 4000 BC, and ending around 2900 BC. The stone structures on the island are among the oldest freestanding stone structures in history, Malta Today says in a long story about the new research. The researchers will try to answer two questions, what killed off the temple people? 
Why do some civilizations survive for many years in fragile environments and others don't? The temple people had 30 temple complexes on Malta and Gozo in their 1,100-year history. They had intricate burial sites, complex rituals and animal sacrifices, Malta today says. Artwork flourished. Archaeologists and others have found hundreds of ancient statues. Some are famous as abundantly fertile fat ladies, but these are only around 15% of the statues found. Phallic and androgynous symbols are much more common. How the islands managed to sustain such a rich culture is a mystery. Another mystery is how it all ended, the story says. The temple people left no written documents to tell what their lives and society were like and why their civilization declined. So scientists have to examine physical clues to reconstruct the past and say how they lived and why they died out. Archaeologists, biologists and geologists will do soil and pollen sampling, GPS and LIDAR studies and try to tie it in with what is known of the temple people's agriculture, architecture, art and why it all ended. The group will take 12 core samples of soil and sediments down to the bedrock, which ranges from 6.56 feet, 2 meters, to 65.6 feet, 20 meters, deep. One of the researchers likened soil samples to taking a biopsy. If I find material in the core that is suggestive of a very wooded environment it means that the environment was wooded but then eroded. If erosion has taken place, it means that the landscape might not have been heavily terraced. Everything is linked, said Nicholas Velia of the University of Malta. They will study the remains of mollusks found in the cores to determine the ecology and cultural habits of ancient people of Malta and a nearby island, Gozo. The species of snails on Malta are the same as 7,000 years ago. There are three main types of snails on Malta, said researcher Katrin Fennec, land snails brackish water mollusks and marine mollusks. If you find a snail shell that needed shade in a dry, rocky place, one could assume the area had previously been treed before people arrived on Malta in Neolithic times. The Malta Today writer asked Fennec if rapid climate change may have contributed to the demise of the temple people. She told him to define rapid and said there were periods of cooler, drier weather and warmer, wetter weather. But inadequate radiocarbon dating and core sampling has limited speculation about whether climate change contributed to the temple people's decline, Fenuk said. The new studies, called Fragsess, will change that. The Maltese researchers and others are looking at cores for pollen, soil composition, bone fragments, and volcanic tephra particles. The research team is called Fragsess for fragility and sustainability in the restricted island environments of Malta. The team includes 19 academics, 10 postdoctorate researchers and about 50 students from 7 countries and 5 institutions. The institutions include the University of Malta, Malta Heritage and Cambridge University. The two primary areas of research are mortuary research and landscape research, the Fraxis website says. Velia and two other Maltese researchers will study landscapes to determine how the people used land for raising animals and growing crops, two of the main sources of ancient Maltese diet. The temple people likely had cattle, sheep, goats, barley, wheat, lentils, olives and fruit, Malta today says. Fraxis will try to answer how the people raised their animals, what a day in their life looked like why they didn't fish much, how much trade there was with other civilizations, were people healthy, and who was being buried at these sites, the leaders of the settlements or everyone. We are quite sure how the temple people did not die, but uncertain about why they did, the story says. 6. Kaj Catacombs. The discovery of some 2,000-year-old tombs from the Roman era in Malta have archaeologists buzzing. They say the bones are so old they can't be called by the name Maltese, but the deceased were likely of Mediterranean origin, and some include the skeletons and skulls of young children. One particularly touching human remnant was a small tooth of a baby, with no other teeth or skeletal remains that could be found, says a story about the find in times of Malta.com. The area around Rabat is rich with remains, the Sunday Times of Malta quotes Anthony Pace, the Maltese government's superintendent of cultural heritage. These tombs are the latest discovery we have made, 
with some interesting content. This is just the beginning of the process. Discovering a site is definitely a thrilling experience, but so too is analyzing skulls in the labs, for instance. Some of the skeletons are beautiful, there's no other word for them. We're not crazy, we're archaeologists. The site is a series of catacombs underneath a school in Rabat, a Maltese town. The catacombs are underneath St. Paul's and Street Agatha's catacombs, says a story about the find in The Independent. What was surprising was that the skeletons and skulls were totally undisturbed by grave robbers. Cultural authorities took sightseers on a tour of the catacombs on Sunday. The tombs were found by workers on soccer and athletic fields of St. Paul's Missionary College. Archaeologists eventually turned up the skeletal remains of at least eight people of the island and some decorated pottery, all of which will be used to unravel some of the mysteries of Malta's ancient history. Workers found the first chamber, and then, said Dr. Pace, the archaeologists found more and more. They are crypts apparently carved into stone, the Times article says. One of the tombs has a small shelf carved into the rock just a few feet long and maybe about a foot deep and high, that was used to bury infants, one of several crypts used for babies, the story says. Bernadette Mercy Caspiteri, an anthropologist who is analyzing the bones and teeth, said at the time child mortality rates were high, and the families would bury their children in these many tombs and plaster them shut. They would open it and put in new burials over and over again, she told the Times. The Times asked Dr. Pace who the people were. Maltzness as we know it today is a relatively new invention. Malta would have been home to moving people from the Mediterranean, it would have also had settlers, and they would have considered themselves part of the empire, in this case, the Roman Empire, the Times quoted him as saying. The exact date of the burials is unknown, but it's possible they're from an era when there were many Jews on the island a transition between suzerainty by Carthage and a change over to Roman rule. The contents of the tombs and the location of them may indicate this era, when there were also colonial settlers on the island and many merchants. Dr. Pace told the Times little is known about the era, but these tombs will help shed light on this mysterious period in the island's distant past. Top image, these are some of the skeletal remains discovered in catacombs beneath a school in Rabat, Malta. The public was allowed to go into the tombs to see these bones from about 2,000 years ago, though the precise time these people lived and died is unknown. 7. Vandalized Megaliths of Najdra. Malta's prehistoric temple builders were an advanced civilization, paying careful attention to align the Najdra complex, with celestial activity right from its very inception, according to Norwegian academic Tor Lomsdalen. In a book titled Sky and Purpose in Prehistoric Malta, Sun, Moon and Stars at the Temples of Najdra, Mr. Lomsdalen introduces new evidence and insights into the temple architecture, and its relationships with the sky. The notion that megalithic monuments were deliberately constructed to align with the Sun, Moon and Stars has been well documented. Mr. Lomsdalen presents evidence based on archaeoastronomical observations a field of study which bridges archaeology with astronomy. At the equinoxes, March 20-21 and September 22-23, the rising sun perfectly illuminates the central corridor of the South Temple. During the solstices, June 21 and December 21-22, the sun rises in line with corners of the door jams. The light never extends beyond the altar-like arrangements towards the back of the temples. They knew exactly which parts they wanted to light up. The temple builders knew exactly which parts of the temples they wanted to light up, and which parts they wanted to remain in the dark. The very specific orientation seems to be connected to ritual ceremonies, during the solstices and equinoxes. It has been suggested that Malta had a chiefdom society, that it might have been a priestly class. They might have held ritual feasts with animal sacrifices around those particular times of the year. The arrangement is just too precise to be arbitrary. The Nijdra complex was built in different stages, spanning from the early Gantija phase, c.3,603,000 BC, to the later Tarxian phase, c.3,002,500 BC. Mr. Lomsdalen suggests that the lower left chamber is the oldest part of the South Temple. 
The chamber is a temple in itself, with a proper entrance and three altars. This was followed by rooms 2 and 4 in the middle Gantija phase. The eastern buildings of Nextra were also constructed in the early Gantija phase, c.3,603,000 BC, while the northern buildings were built in the later Tarxian phase each extension to the temple meant that the light's penetration was closed off, causing the temple builders to build new altars or introduce orthostats, large stones set upright, to ensure that the specific features of the temple were illuminated. The very specific alignment of the stones increased in complexity and sophistication through time. They had a very keen knowledge, as they extended the temples, they constantly made modifications to ensure that the light always struck at a particular point. The sun's movement throughout the year casts vertical slits of light on the orthostats. Mr. Lomsdalen suggests the temple builders used it as a sort of calendar device, to keep track of the seasons. To find the exact orientation of Nechtra, the temple builders might have used the open star cluster known as the Pleiades. This could possibly mean that some of the building was done at night. 8. Temple of the Unknown Fertility Cult The Temple of Hagar Kim stands on a hilltop overlooking the sea and the islet of Fifla, not more than 2 kilometers southwest of the village of Krendi. At the bottom of the hill, only 500 meters away, lies another remarkable temple site, Nijdra found above the southern cliffs. The surrounding landscape is typical Mediterranean Garik and spectacular in its starkness and isolation. First excavated in 1839, the remains suggest a date between 3600 to 3200 BC, a period known as the Gantija phase in Maltese prehistory. Hagar Kim was in fact never completely buried as the tallest stones, remained exposed, and featured in 18th and 19th century paintings. The site consists of a central building and the remains of at least two more structures. The large forecourt and the monumental facade of the central structure follow the pattern typical of Maltese prehistoric temples. Along the external wall one may find some of the largest megaliths used in the building of these structures, such as a 5.2 meters high stone and a huge megalith estimated to weigh close to 20 tons. The building itself is made up of a series of C-shaped rooms, known as apses. Walking through the main entrance, one finds a central paved space with an apse on each side. These apses are more firmly screened off than is usual at other temple sites using walls, and slabs with square-shaped portholes cut through as doorways. During excavations a slab bearing a pair of opposing spirals in relief, and a freestanding pillar decorated on all four sides were found in the area. These have been replaced with replicas on site, and the originals can be found at the National Museum of Archaeology. Through the inner passage one finds an apse on the right and a large space on the left. The apse on the right has a curious setting of low stone slabs forming an inner enclosure. At the rear of this apse is a small elliptical hole. The rays of the rising sun on the first day of summer, the summer solstice, pass through this hole and illuminate one of the low slabs. The large space on the left holds three high so-called table altars, and a doorway to an additional chamber reached by three steps. Three more chambers form part of this building but these can only be reached through doorways along the outer wall. Much of interest has been unearthed at Hagar Kim, notably stone and clay statuettes of obese figures which are also found at the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta. 9. Paleochristian Catacombs The Paleochristian heritage of the Maltese Islands rates as the fourth most important cluster of such monuments in the Mediterranean region following those of the Italy, Israel and of the Maghreb, of which its most prominent feature is its extensive concentration of subterranean burial grounds. An ancient set of catacombs in Mosta, Malta, dating back almost 1,700 years will now become more accessible as a result of a new walkway and reception center, which will enable visitors to delve into the splendor of Malta's ancient past. The catacombs of Malta have been described by UNESCO, as excellent documents of the changing cultural, artistic and social climates of the Mediterranean world in the centuries going from the 3rd to the centuries ad. In a period covering the mid-3rd to the early 7th century ad, burial grounds developed in Malta from a tradition of simple rock-cut tombs of the Phoenician and Hellenistic eras, 700 BC, 100 AD. 
while most of the catacombs of Malta are concentrated under the modern town of Rabat and the surrounding rural districts. The planned upgrade work planned by Heritage Malta pertains to the Tabistra catacombs in Masta, which is currently on the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The Tabistra site is an extensive network of catacombs with individual entrances, within the vertical face of the ridge looking northwards towards St. Paul's Bay. It consists of 16 groups of hypogea, chambers, tunneled next to each other and features spiral borders, scallop shells, arched pottery shelves, pilasters, and agape tables. Unlike the catacombs in Rabat that were dug underground, the ones at Tabistra were cut by means of tunneling in the face of the ridge. The Tabistra catacombs were first unearthed in 1891 by F. Vassalo and later recorded by Charles Zamet in 1933. But by then the site had long been looted because the Knights of St. John used to issue licenses for treasure hunting. In 2005, another part of the catacomb network came to light during road works. One remarkable feature of the Maltese catacombs is the commingling of religious rites, which includes clear references to Christianity, pagan practices and Judaism, all within the same locality. This reflects the cohabitation of these different cultures within late Roman society. According to UNESCO, this mixed feature of the Maltese catacombs is rarely equaled anywhere else in the Mediterranean. 10. Temple of the Giants Everyone knows about the magnificent temples of ancient Egypt, and ancient Greece, but one country containing some of the oldest, and best preserved temples in the world gets comparatively little attention, Malta. Malta is a southern European country in the Mediterranean Sea, just 80 kilometers south of Sicily. The country covers just over 300 kilometers too, making it one of the world's smallest and most densely populated countries. Yet on this small island country, there are literally dozens of ancient sites, 11 megalithic temples, and seven of them are UNESCO World Heritage listed. Although debatable, UNESCO describes Malta's prehistoric temples as the oldest free-standing monuments on Earth. The temples date from 5500 to 2500 BC, making them older than Stonehenge and older than the pyramids of Egypt, according to current perspectives. The dating of the site was done using radiocarbon testing of pottery, and bones found around those temples in Malta. Dr. Nicholas Velia of the University of Malta says, that until further evidence is found that will put Stonehenge, or the pyramids far into the timeline, the temples of Malta remain the oldest known temples still standing. The most well-known sites include the temples of Gantija on the island of Gozo, Hagar Kim and Nindra. According to folklore, Gantija was built by a giantess who used it as a place of worship. Malta has a rich prehistoric past. Dating of bones, and pottery from all around the island has shown, that it was first populated in at least 5500 BC. More than 50 temples were found on the islands of Malta, and most of them are constructed in the same design which includes a central corridor with two, or more chambers and an altar at the end. Archaeologists do not know exactly how the temples were used but the common theory is that they were used as ceremonial places for polytheistic religions which included sacrifice of animals and or humans. Archaeological evidence, including numerous figurines and statues, suggests that the sacrifices were made to the goddess of fertility. The culture of megalithic builders apparently disappeared from the Maltese islands around 2500 BC. Archaeologists speculate that the temple builders fell victim to famine or disease, 